Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of the Future Tech Podcast. It's me, Charlie Sell, Board Director at The Major Group, where I get to talk to, interview, just have really open conversations with technology leaders, people who are passionate about STEM and learning and really wanting to give back to our community. The podcast, as you know, is sponsored by the STEM Ambassador Association, so it's shared across the colleges, universities and schools, and it's also on our website. I am really, really pleased to have Thibaut Poujan with me today. Now, uh, forgive me if I get the, uh, it's a French surname, so I may not pronounce it properly. But Thibaut is the VP of Engineering at Gusto. And I'm sure many people will know Gusto. But Gusto is a, well, we, we describe it as a data business that loves food. Um, a B Corp business, so very, very passionate about the values um, and health and well-being. Anyone who knows or has received the Gusto food boxes will know it's a really important part of what they do. Um, I'm sure Debo will talk a little bit more about that. But for now, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Well, Debo, let's jump straight in and tell us about your story. How did you get into technology and tell us a bit about your career? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I'll probably try to go back to somewhat to the beginning because this is uh, meant for people to learn about how do you get a career in STEM in general. Uh, so I'll go back probably around high school time. Um, as far as I can remember, uh, I've had a passion for math, or I liked it, uh, I would say. Uh, and towards the end of high school, it, I developed more into a passion. Um, and it was really math as opposed to anything else. Um, and I, I think Retrospectively looking at it, what I really liked about it is two things. One is it's a very helpful tool, right? If you if you know math well, you can you know, calculate the trajectory of a rocket to go to Mars, which is a pretty powerful thing, or calculate how much concrete you need for your bridge not to fall. Um, and that felt like a really good tool. That's that's helpful. Um, the other thing and what I what really sort of triggered my passion is this kind of language to explore abstract ideas. And there's a sense of certainty and a sense of beauty that I very much relate to. Um, and that's kind of what I really liked exploring. So towards the end of high school, following that passion for math, I went on to university. Uh, if I had my way, I probably would have worked only on math, but I'm very glad I didn't do that only. Um, I went to university where I had to focus on uh, at least eight different topics uh, from philosophy to painting to um, all the sciences, the humanities, um, and et cetera. And you constantly had to look at a lot of things, uh, which in retrospect, I'm very happy with because it gave me a broad panel from which to talk to a lot of different people. Um, so I studied this for a few years um, and then still following my passion for math, went on to do graduate studies. So as you mentioned, I'm French. So I did my undergrad in France. Um, and then moved on to the US for my graduate studies. Um, I did a, a PhD in math there in, uh, in New York. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought my life was gonna be advancing humanities knowledge by doing math research. Uh, that felt like a meaningful purpose and a great experience to me. Um, but what I realized is as I went kind of towards the, through my PhD, um, things went like, it was hard in the sense that you would get to conceptual ideas and you would get to something that felt like a research plan, but it would take what you would think about in four to six months, it would take 10 years to realize. Um, and so I had a bit of a self questioning around whether this is what I wanted to do in terms of the pace of learning and kind of the pace at which you, you grow through it. Um, and eventually I came to the conclusion that I wanted to learn to work with people and work at a faster space than, than what I had learned in academia. It didn't develop those skills for me. And so I, I looked a little bit around, there were lots of, you know, presentation on campus around what kind of career you can get into. Uh, I stumbled upon something that was management consulting. I knew nothing of it. Um, and I remember the pitch was something like, the CEO of PepsiCo will have a problem around how to configure their uh, Coke machine. And um, they will ask someone who studied music, uh, an Olympian athlete and an MBA student to solve it. And lo and behold, they do. And I thought this is either genius or complete BS, um, but I'm interested. Um, and so, you know, one thing led to the next. Uh, I uh, eventually went into management consulting, which at the time felt a little bit like going to the dark side, but I, I, embraced, uh, I embraced the experience. 
Um, and I think that the truth is, it's probably a little bit of a BS, but also a bit of magic. Um, and I spent the next six to seven years at McKinsey in, uh, in the Netherlands. I moved back to the Netherlands where my girlfriend's from. Uh, and I, I love the experience because every single day you work with people who are really high caliber, you work on complex problems, you discover new, new industries, new organizations. So it's a constant experience of learning, getting better at things. It's also a very good experience in learning yourself and learning to know yourself because if you want to be able to operate in different contexts and have high resilience you need to know yourself really well um, so it's really what i remember is being constantly positively challenged uh, in a positive way um, to go back to sort of the the career arc i think the in the beginning i focused mostly on strategic problems because it felt like these were complex problems and i really wanted to get my problem solving skills um, experienced um, and then what i had i had the experience of i've done the best strategy i could think of for a, a client and then um, came back a couple of years later was sure they were going to be number one and the strategy document that we worked on so hard was now a document in a drawer um, and so i had really this second mini crisis i guess where um, I, I asked myself well, what does it actually take for people to do the work not just we come up with the work um, that was actually really wrong if the consultant comes up with the work and comes up with the answer. It's like, how do you really help the organization to be successful? So from there, I, I really pivoted from strategy to what you call organizational change. And uh, what it means is you're looking at how do you transform organization? What's, what makes an individual going to do something different tomorrow than they do today? Um, how do you do this on an organizational level? Um, and through that, I spent a lot of time on topics like agility. Agility is really a way of speaking about how do you go in a certain direction, achieve your certain goal, but are quite dynamic along the way. Um, and so this is something that was quite well known in technology because there's a lot of ambiguity and less well known in the broader business. And I try to really spend some time trying to bring those two things together. All organization became more and more technology organization. Um, and to learn to do these things together was uh, was a problem that I was really interested in. Um, so it's really around culture, uh, eventually how people relate to that dynamic learning curve and that adaptation um, going forward. So as you can see, it kind of took me reasonably far away from math, uh, but what I could really count on through my whole career is having this ability to work through abstract concepts and knowing a little bit about many disciplines helped me really get connected to many parts of organization quite quickly. Um, so I did this for my time at McKinsey and then, then I moved on to a company called Salando in Germany, uh, where, which is a, um, a tech company that uh, sells clothes online essentially. So it's a platform company. Uh, it was eight years old when I, when I joined, but already something like 20 billion market cap. So something that had grown incredibly fast I needed to do a big transition. Uh, so I went to do that transition uh, and I was there in the people team, so in the HR team. Um, so again, doing something very different uh, type of job. Uh, and I was having a tech-ish role in that team where we were building our own tools um, and, uh, and really building kind of product management and really transforming the organization. And then about two and a half years ago, I uh, moved from Zalando to Gusto uh, here in the UK. Um, and the reason why I came to Gusto is I felt a connection when I talked to the people that I met, uh, one, to the purpose of the company. Uh, it really makes a difference for me every single day uh, when I get up to say every new customer will have their life improved and will have a positive impact on the planet. That really makes a difference to me. Um, and second is uh, the culture is really a culture of learning where people are passionate to really do something different every time. It's not been done, uh, so reinventing. Uh, so I was I was quite keen to explore. Um, so two years ago when I joined, I looked after the digital product team. And then about six months ago, I moved across to software engineering. Um, and that's where I still am today and uh, going strong and very happy to enjoy that company. Yeah, wow. What a story. And and what was what's lovely about that is obviously you're, 
you, you've got a born love for STEM, but you've you've been able to use that to then explore different avenues, haven't you? From going from consulting to, to well, it's also allowed you to travel the world, but from being able to look at complex problems, it's not just a linear path, is it? It's you can you can really explore within within these industries, and I think one of the things we were talking about before the podcast is the importance of learning. You know how how if you can keep that learning journey going every every you know opportunities will keep arising how thinking about your journey and thinking about the importance of learning and, and where that's how that's helped you through your career thinking of our young listeners as well that you know passionate about stem how important is learning and, and and what do you think how does that journey look when people are forever trying to evolve themselves um it's probably a, a mindset i would say it's it's a mindset of really always trying to be curious and trying to learn and grow, right? So you, you, there's a number of, of elements and, and I can talk about some of them that you can put in place to make sure that you're constantly growing through your career. But it starts with, do you work on something that you're passionate about? It can be the problem that in front of you, it can be um, the people that you work with. Um, but overall, I think we're all driven by some sense of wanting to progress. Um, and to me, the, that progress really translates into learning. So it's really that that mindset of, am I curious? Do I really want to understand? Am I challenging myself to acquire the skills that I need to? Um, am I working with others, learning from others, but also teaching others? Um, and if I, if I look back at my career, it's probably been the main driving factor of all the changes that I've made is I really wanted to learn something about a different place. Um, and I think by now I've I've come to almost the other side of it where, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was also teaching math um, and I really loved that. And I, I very much hope that I get back to this at some point. Um, but when you're an organization, you're less teaching to a method, you're less teaching to, um, you know, let's learn this, this particular topic, but you're teaching to a problem because you're, you're together trying to solve problems and trying to get organization to figure out how to solve problems together is really, you know, science and STEM in general has a lot to say about this because it's like, well, let's make some hypothesis and then let's test ourselves around whether we're right, whether we're wrong, when are we right enough to actually progress? Um, and it's really good to see how you apply the scientific method in the business world because it, it asks you to use data, but it also asks you to know when you're wrong and kind of check your ego at the door when you enter. Um, and all of these processes are really hard to master, but they're really what helps you grow, I think, in your career and keeps you on your toes and excited. Yeah, and 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 as you say, it's although it is hard to master that 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 love and to keep pushing yourself. And and again, I think I think the wonderful word about technology and um, is that is one industry that is forever evolving. I mean, I think there was a stat I saw the other day that 95% of the jobs in 2030 haven't even been invented yet within the fields of technology specifically, but STEM as a wider career. So it's it's actually a point prevalent, not just to the young people listening on the podcast, but I think at, at all career levels, you know, that the importance of pushing ourselves and adapting and evolving should be a fundamental driver you know, throughout our life, I guess. It's, um, you know, have you seen that in your business then? Do you see that the, the top performing people or the people who you earmark as go, right, that person's going somewhere, they have that mindset, they are they are forever trying to challenge? A hundred percent. I think the, the quote is, it's probably Darwin's quote, who said, um, it's not the most intelligent that will, that will strive or that will survive, it's the one that adapts themselves the best. Um, and you, I'm paraphrasing, but I mean, you can use intelligence to adapt yourself better, but it, it's not the same skill. Um, and if, if there's one thing that I think everyone agrees to is that the pace of change uh, today in the world in general is, is just increasing. And so the one constant that we can expect through the 21st century is that things will keep changing faster and faster. Um, and you can see that technology is a wonderful way to actually manage that change. Um, and there is there's a lot of ambiguity in in technology because the cost of failure is really hard, right? If you build a technology and by the time you build it, it's not the right thing, then you've spent all the time and all that effort for nothing. Um, so there there is a lot of thinking that's been going on in the last thirty to fifty years into how do you constantly adapt? Um, you know, software engineering and agility is a great example of this. Uh, 
is like, we don't really know what customers want. We know some things, but let's build the smallest thing we can to go in the right direction. And then let's let's take it from there. So it's quite codified. But eventually the, the principle is really to say, we don't know what the future looks like, but we're going to, our skill will be to adapt ourselves as good as we can to what we see arise. Um, and I honestly think that the organizations that will do well in the 21st century are those who can adapt themselves the best. Another way of saying it is those who can learn the best, right? Uh, eventually, adaptation is just a method for learning. Um, and that's true of organization. I think that's true of individuals. Um, a good example is, you know, two years ago, most people had never heard of Gen AI and thought that AI was just something for a few a few passionate folks somewhere. Um, and then today, whatever you whatever you think about it, you know that maybe you don't have to be scared of Gen AI, but you have to be scared of the person who knows how to do your job leveraging those, those technologies. Um, and so if you don't kind of adapt yourself to that, then you're probably going to become obsolete reasonably fast. And, and I think that's an absolutely fantastic point because, you know, and, and Gen AI, I was speaking to another um, uh, another another contact the other day who was just talking about we were reminiscing when cloud computing first cloud technologies first hit the market and there was this reticence and and, and people would believe were thinking no this isn't going to happen who's going to trust their data to be in the cloud and and especially and you know especially from the banks thinking this is archaic and fast forward five ten years and it is it's it is now part of our everyday world and any any business that hasn't embraced um, cloud technology will will be obsolete, and those people in there. And, and Gen AI, I feel, is just another iteration. It's, it's it's the evolvement of where you're going. And of course, there's examples where things probably haven't been proven yet. And we can talk about Meta and the Metaverse and blockchain, but but that hasn't been there off the radar yet. And um, I mean, the thing that gets me very excited is quantum computing. Yet this still sits very much as an academic concept but when you really peel back and you look at the, the opportunities of what the next five ten years can bring us it it does keep coming back to learning but it also comes back to embracing as you said you don't have to be the most intelligent person in the room but you've got to know how to evolve and, and, and adapt and again i'm now paraphrasing off your paraphrase <laughs> so as always the podcast has absolutely flown by and and we've got to the stage now of that career advice um you know for our young people who are who are thinking either about getting their first job into tech or maybe even their second job what what one or two bits of advice would you give um to people listening on, on how they can actually stand out and get that first role um i think there's there's a couple of, of things that are those are helpful to to keep in mind the first one is it's going to be really hard to do your best if you don't at least like a lot what you do. Uh, so there is, again, that saying that says, um, do what you like and love what you do. And I think loving what you do is is really just putting work into it, staying curious, having that, that positive uh, attitude towards it. Uh, but you have to sort of focus on something that you have a chance at liking, right? So don't go into the worst job for yourself, but, but also take something where you have a good chance to learn skills and then apply yourself to this and realistically you're going to come out of this experience in a, a better person than you entered it and i think that's always worth doing um the second thing is probably don't box yourself in too much right so if i had just followed my own thinking at the time i probably would have gone only into math and only into this and only into that um, and i'm so glad retros retrospectively for all the experiences that really expanded my horizons. And as we talked, my career ended up being quite broad and quite nonlinear. Um, and I'm very glad for this, right? It really just enriched my experiences and you can do pattern recognition even unconsciously from one place to the next. There's those famous saying of, you know, one of the most important things for Steve Jobs was to uh, follow this course on calligraphy, right? Um, but you have to be open to those experiences and not everything needs to be part of a plan. Um, you have to not box yourself in too much. Um, and I think the third thing, and it might be obvious to your listeners, um, is I think today you have to invest into some level of basic STEM literacy, I would call it. If you don't have a basic understanding of how to manipulate data or even statistics, right? You don't need to be calculating complicated uh, concepts in math or statistics or applied math. Uh, 
but you need to be able to understand data and what it tells you. Um, I think more and more when you look at what ChatGPT brings, you need to be able to talk to this and understand what are the limits of AI. Um, you don't really need to code, but you need to be able to understand that. Maybe you will need to code, I don't know. Um, but even if you're someone who's purely looking at the humanities, you need to understand data. Um, you need to understand what Gen AI can do for you in the world. Um, so there is, there's a level of basic literacy around STEM that I think everyone will need to have um, because that's where most of the game-changing innovations will come from. And that's where we need to understand to adapt ourselves again. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, great, great bits of advice. Thank you, uh, Tivo, because that's, um, you know, all three super, super relevant to uh, uh, to our listeners. So, oh, look, well, time has flown by. So um, this is a, uh, well, first of all, a massive thank you for Tivo. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And to our listeners, um, this is another episode of our Future Tech podcast. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it is shared on the STEM Ambassador Association, um, along with our website, uh, majorgroup.com forward slash podcast, and on our Spotify channel. So for everyone, thank you for tuning in or watching the podcast. One more time, a thank you for Tebow, And that's another episode of Future Tech. <laughs>